I'm starting to see more BMS companies replacing low-level control with high-level control um, to try and reduce their tender price and win more jobs. So what that means is, you know, traditionally we have a BMS controller, we have a digital output hardwired to a variable speed drive for start-stop, a digital input hardwired for status, an analog output hardwired for the 0 to 10 volt speed control signal. I'm seeing it more often where all of those points, those low level hardwired points, are removed from all the variable speed drives. All the chill water system pumps, all the hot water system pumps, all the air handling unit variable speed drives, all the exhaust fans, the outside air fans, and the car park systems, the whole lot, 100 variable speed drives. But, and the reason for this video is that I see a lot of the time, or so far most of the time, that BMS companies are not putting any additional design um, or risk mitigation engineering or, or commissioning or anything into making this significant change workable. So in this video, we're gonna run through four things that in my opinion, you have to do if you wanna go down this rabbit hole. first one is you have to formally depart from the mechanical specification that you're not going to be compliant because I would guess that most mechanical specifications if not all of them buried down the quality sections will have some words around all control being by low level and not by high level interface or if they don't have that, they might have some redundancy clauses in there that talks about the reliability and the points of failure and the redundancy of the control system, which HLI doesn't really meet. And if not, you know, probably half the consultants will have a points list at the back of the specification as an appendix. That points list would have digital outputs, digital inputs, and analog outputs. And by having that, that would imply low-level control. Even some consultancies don't have a you know, um, a project specific points list. They might have a condensed points list where they have like, here are the points for an air handling unit, um, you know, fan, pump, you know, chiller, just some, you know, basic stuff, a couple of pages. And even in there, there'll be the digital outputs, the digital inputs and the analog outputs, again, implying low level control. So if you want to go down this, you need to cover yourself and formally depart. Now, just writing a few words in italic in the function description, in my mind, is not departing. Um, you can't expect the client and their independent reviewers to understand you know, a 100-page function description, what that means. You need to write a letter via the mechanical contractor to the owner or via the builder confirming that you are not doing, uh, you're not doing low-level control and you do all the control via the network, and this is how you can mitigate the risk. You've got to do that. Otherwise, you'll get caught out at the end. Second thing you need to do is um, you need to redesign your BMS network and specifically the RS485 sub networks to break them into smaller pieces and start reducing network failures from impacting on your control system. I did a job last year where um, the, the main consultant that was doing the job had asked me to come in and help them with witnessing. So I roll in there, I print out the BMS function description. I'm doing the witnessing for a couple of days, walking around site, doing quality inspections, the whole thing. And I'm sitting there going through the control system. Everything, of course, works. You know, functionally, it all works. And I'm looking at the points list. And in the points list, I just, I just don't see all these points. They're all missing. So I said to the BMS company, are you guys controlling via the network? Where are all these low-level points? Like, yep, we're doing HLI control. And I was like, okay. So I said, let's go to the plant room. So I walk at the plant room, and we've got some, you know, duty standby exhaust fans i said to them okay look do me a, a rotation change so on the graphics it clicks the rotation change and the two fans rotate over um, the, the duty fan stops and the standby fan starts okay fine good i said let's, let's simulate a um a run status rotation failure so we go up to the pressure switch across the running fan we pull the tubes out the bms lose the run status via the network and the vsd and we rotate over Great, that's good. Put the tubes back in there. Last test, and I'm thinking, 
all right? Turn the power off to the VSD. Turn the power off, so I'm simulating a VSD failure or a circuit breaker being tripped, lose power to VSD, the motor stops, what happens? Nothing, because the BMS, a lot of BMS systems, when a network device goes offline, they will retain the last reliable value. In this particular system, this particular BMS, that's what happened. When the VSD went offline, got an offline thing in the alarm register, but it retained the last reliable state which was running and then never changed over. So that was a big issue and that's not something they thought about. And that was actually one of the points that resulted in them not getting sign off. So the second point there was, if you're gonna do HLI control, you gotta significantly think about changing how you do networks. You can't have some BMS controllers with some VSDs and a thermal meter and then you know, three uh, electrical meters on the end there. You need to have robust control because you're saving money by not running cables. You need to make that up and spend some more money somewhere else. Um, actually, I don't, in my opinion, HLI control probably isn't actually even cheaper. Yeah, you save money on cables, but lots of things go wrong in other places. So that was the second point. The third point is if you're going to go down the HLI control, you need to properly coordinate with everybody else and make sure you have a complete end-to-end -end solution. So that other job, so I'm standing there and um, I'm looking at the, the mechanical boards and there's all these handoff auto switches. And I'm thinking in my mind, handoff auto switches. So there should be a digital output on the controller. That cable should run into the mech board. It should go into a relay. The contact should go through the handoff auto switch to a relay and the VST should start. But we don't have that digital output anymore. So I said to the BMS company, how do the handoff auto switches work? Ah, uh, they don't work because that wasn't coordinated. The mechanical electrician built the mech boards as specified. It wasn't properly coordinated. And now we have, you know, a couple of hundred handoff auto switches that just they don't work. And that's a big deal. Like, um, you know, I am, if I'm the consultant and I'm, and I'm signing off and I, and I want to sign off, I want to write a practical completion letter and say this building, you know, meets the intent of the specification. It doesn't. And it's fit for purpose. It's not. Um, and, and I give it to the client. And the client says, but Brass, we've got all these handoff order switches that just don't do anything. We have relays in mech boards that don't do anything. Like how, how is that, you know, a complete system? So that third point was, if you're going to go down this road, it's not just what you're doing. You're going to coordinate with everybody else. And I actually think that this process, this coordination process and the the, the design and the engineering and this better way to do things um, to support this alternative solution, you don't start that in the design phase, you start that in the estimating phase. So when the salesman is back in the office, 30 Ks from site, and he's crossing off things off this list and saving $400 a point as he goes through this, at that point, you've got to get the engineers in there and, and, and work out an end-to-end -end solution that this thing's going to work in the end and you're not going to get caught at the end. The fourth point is, is commissioning sheets. So when I'm signing the job off, there's a whole bunch of things I need to do. The one thing I have to have is part of the commissioning process, the SIBSI guidelines and ERA and ASHRA and all these commissioning guidelines which are actually noted in every single specification in the world. We're gonna meet those requirements and I have to have point-to-point -point commissioning sheets. Now BMS companies, well, there wasn't really a need to have HLI commissioning sheets you know, a long time ago because all the control was by low level and the HLI was usually a nice to have bit of monitoring. So we would always get point to point commissioning sheets for the controllers with a, a, a technician's um, initials or signature and then a date. But we don't get them for HLI. If you're gonna go down the HLI route, you start creating HLI point to point commissioning sheets. It's not a point to point, but you know what I mean. So I wanna sit there and I wanna see for every single variable speed drive a sheet that has all the points in there and the pressure sensor, the start stop, the status, the fault, the speed signal, all those points need to have an initial, like follow the process, you know, a signature initial date. So I can sit there and say, okay, so I can see that you guys have commissioned and tested through the HLI system that all these points have been commissioned and they actually work. I have to have that, I can't not have that. So right at the end, if you've somehow snuck through under the radar with your HLI solution, you could get caught out there. Somebody, the independent reviewer, the client's reviewer, the independent commissioning agent, someone will be going through the commissioning process and going through the commission sheets and like, 
where are all these points? And then it comes out of the wash. Firstly, you've gone HLI and not you know, mitigate the risk. And secondly, you don't have commissioning sheets, you're not getting signed off. Now, another thing, which is quite important, is you know, I always tell people, yes, if I was doing the BMS design and I was working for a BMS company, I would do all these things. But when I'm a consultant and I'm reviewing something, I have a different hat on, I do things differently. Because consultants, we, we have professional indemnity insurance. Like, it's expensive. I've got to pay every month for insurance that if somebody sues me because a design didn't work, then I've got a $5 million to go to court, fight the case, and pay whatever it is, then to redesign the system. So all that insurance costs money. So if I'm sitting there, and the hand of order switches don't work, I've already proven that you know the thing doesn't work, if it rotates, if it loses power, the commission sheets aren't there, I'm just gonna, I have to play it safe and, and it's not gonna get signed off because I can't put my signature on that piece of paper and my reputation to say that this building is fit for purpose when it's, it's not. Like you guys haven't given me what I need to sign off. You put me between a rock and a hard place. And that job last year, like it was a bad day. I, I was sitting there, the builder was already under two or three months of liquidated damages. It was stressful and I said, look, I'm sorry, but you stop running cables. Um, I'll be back in four weeks. They're like, Bryce, we don't have four weeks. We're, we're, we're getting, we're at the pump. We're getting penalized every week. And I'm like, like I want to sign off. I can't sign off. Start running cables and start installing new controllers. And that, my friends, is a true story. So if you got something out of that, you're not too annoyed with me, um, like and subscribe. And I'll see you guys next week.